Hello and welcome to our week one course content video. Um, let's start off by covering the key concepts for this week. We're going to be looking at autobiographical narratives, the multiple intelligences, and unpacking our knapsack. These are the first three topics in week one, um, chapter one. And then we're going to look at chapter two, American education and deculturalization. What is the price of education? Um, one of the things I want you to think about are some of these quotes here um, as we get started with this week one video. Um, they relate to our topic in several specific ways, but let me go ahead and read them with you and be thinking about these as we proceed. The first one is, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. That's from Benjamin Franklin. The next quote, they may forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. That's by Collard Bridgner. And then the last one by Socrates said, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. So hopefully this week's video helps engage you in some critical thought and helps you learn the content a little bit more in depth. So with that, let's go ahead and go to our next slide. Um, the autobiographical narratives assignment. This is talked about in chapter one, section one of your iBook. Um, it really discusses the importance of autobiographical narratives. In particular, it discusses the four key dimensions of the student biography. Those dimensions being the social, cultural, linguistic, academic, and cognitive. As a teacher in the college of education, as well as in my prior experiences in teaching in schools, I think it's essential that we look at students' autobiographical narratives and get to know who they are because we can't really teach students effectively if we don't know their whole background, their whole biography, or in this case, their whole narrative. So I've included a sample autobiographical narrative here. This is mine. Hopefully you can see kind of what it should look like at the end, but I'm looking for probably a lot more creativity in yours because you guys are great. So here we go. Hello, my name is Dr. Della Perez, and I wanted to start with this picture because it represents one of the most important people in my life, my husband Miguel, and it is a very important picture to me because we've been married for 23 very happy years, and I think it's a great picture to start with so you get to know a little bit about me. This picture represents my family and my background when it comes to language. My parents both spoke Spanish, but they didn't teach their children Spanish because at the time it was thought to be bad to speak two languages. You only had to speak English to be successful in school. Thankfully, I was able to learn Spanish as an adult and in high school, and I'm now able to use it in my college career where I was able to take students abroad to Ecuador and we used our Spanish to have educational experiences in school. This slide rep my, represents my academic background. As you can see from an early age, education is very important. I graduated from high school with honors and I continue working with uh, K-State with my doctorate and supporting elementary pre-service teachers and secondary teachers, as well as you in the math program. This picture represents my cognitive background. It's a little bit different in the sense of I've learned to think differently since I'm a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with breast cancer a few years ago. I had a mastectomy and thankfully everything is well. I am a survivor and I have now learned to think differently about life and appreciate everything I have and everyone in it. One of the most important people in my life besides my husband is my daughter who is a wonderful dancer and swimmer. She also loves emojis, so this last birthday we made emoji cookies, which is one of my hobbies. I love to bake, as you can see, and we have a little puppy named Cookie. Kind of goes with the picture, but she is the star of our home. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed my autobiographical narrative. Um, it's just an example of what yours can look like when you're done. I really look forward to seeing all your autobiographical narratives. Remember, those are going to be due tomorrow, and then you'll have a chance to watch each other's autobiographical narratives and give some feedback. So please make sure to do that according to the course schedule. Another thing that's talked about in this first chapter of your iBook are multiple intelligences. You may have heard of this concept before, maybe even you know what your multiple intelligences are. Um, we're going to explore them a little bit more in depth in this chapter. We're going to hear from the actual creator of the Multiple Intelligences, Howard Gardner. 
There's a video included in the iBook chapter for you to watch. I encourage you to do that. And then you're going to see the different types of intelligences here. Um, you will take an actual survey to figure out what your strongest intelligence is. Again, I think this help will help you as a future educator get to know how you approach learning and instruction because it will have a definite impact on your instruction. If you are more of a bodily kinesthetic type learner, you're more likely to put that into your own future instructional practice. If you're more logical mathematical, you might teach that way. But we need to remember as future educators, we want to teach to all the intelligences. So in order to get a better idea of what your intelligence is and how you might um, gear your instruction, go ahead and make sure you look at chapter one, section two, uh, page 13. There's a link to the multiple intelligences. Um, I showed that to you in the welcome video when we went over that. Actually, sorry, I showed it to you in the iBook um, overview video, but the link is here again if you need it. After you take the survey and figure out what your strongest intelligences are, I want you to kind of think about these questions here. Um, what did you discover? Uh, what are the implications you can draw from your results? Why do you think it's so important to know what your intelligence are as a learner because you're doing this based on your own learning style? And then how might this affect you as a future teacher? I told you, you know, given our intelligences, we might definitely tailor our instruction to those intelligences that are strongest. But we need to remember, as a future teacher, some of the implications of this would be we need to make sure we're hitting all the intelligences because students in our classrooms are going to reflect a range of those intelligences. And the more we can touch on those, the better. So to learn a little bit more about multiple intelligences, we're going to listen to a coffee talk here and get some more information. I hope you enjoy. Well, welcome. I am Dr. Della Pritz, and I'm here with Dr. Lori Levine. And we're going to talk to you just a little bit today about multiple intelligences and their importance in the classroom. So Dr. Levine, thank you so much for being here today. I'm glad to join you. Thank you. Well, we have known a lot about multiple intelligences and their importance. And Dr. Gardner did a lot of research on multiple intelligences and said that they're very important for making sure that students are actively engaged in the classroom. We have eight different intelligences. But can you tell me from an educator's perspective why they're so important? Well, it gives you a way to differentiate instruction for your students. It gives you insight into all the other aspects about learning that you can't see. Um, traditional methods of assessing and teaching, we now know, are not tremendously effective. And so it gives you just greater insight and um, it gives you a lot more um, sort of opportunity to use different tools and meet the needs of your learners truly. Yeah. Have you um, seen in the classroom specific examples of teachers who may be more traditional in their approach, but then when they actually incorporate things like the visual and spatial and maybe the bodily kinesthetic, they really capture those students and really turn the learning around? Absolutely. I've seen the difference just in the shift from uh, my own educational experiences as a student growing up in the 1970s classroom um, into my own teacher uh, sort of education those multiple intelligences, how Gardner's work was just at the forefront, and so I had that foundation as an elementary education major back in the 1980s. Um, and then uh, applying those things and seeing those things with my students um, in my classroom, being an early childhood educator, I realized right away uh, that you could see uh, children's tendencies, you could see their intelligences at work, and you can play on those, and I have seen a great shift. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, you know, if my own students here at the university level, you think that, oh, well, we can just give them lectures and not really actively engage yeah. them, but I think they learn so much more when they're involved, and they get all those involved and involved. And as, you know, early service, pre-service teachers going into elementary education, it's so important to teach them how to tap into those different functions with their future students, too, because the more you can get them using things like the musical intelligence, using the visual spatial, using the, even that naturalistic intelligence. You wouldn't think it's important to get students out into nature, into but nature. getting them out there, getting them involved, getting them seeing the world around them, it's a whole new intelligence that can tap into and really build upon. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, as early educators and elementary educators, we need to think about that and how we can really build upon that with our mm -hmm. students so that we actively engage all those intelligence. Some students are gonna learn better 
if they can tap into that musical ability and think about those connections to song. Whereas others are going to be better able to learn about it through the interpersonal or interpersonal. So in lots of different ways, and we can't just focus on one of those. I agree. And I think the way that we utilize technology, we have so many more tools that we can use. And we have multimedia opportunities, you can have iPads in your classroom, or even if you're just using audio and video with some of the wonderful kinds of things you can find on school tube and teacher tube. Uh, we've got some really good things that tap into all of the children's different learning styles. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today a little bit about the multiple intelligences, how they benefit you, and how you utilize them in your classroom. Absolutely. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that coffee talk. It was just a little bit more insight from one of our professors here in the College of Education about the multiple intelligences and the importance of those. Let me turn this down just a little bit. Okay, so let's move on. Um, the last section of Chapter 1 of your iBook really looks at unpacking our knapsack and looking at privilege and how privilege has influenced us. Um, and why it's important to understand that concept of oppression and privilege and how it can affect our lives. So as you go through this section, I really encourage you to have an open mind. This isn't about blame. It's not about saying that because of your ethnicity, you've had all these advantages. That's not it at all. It's really just asking you to think about from your own background, your own autobiographical narrative perspective, some of the impacts that might have had on your experiences and experiences of others. Um, and then as you think about this, um, the concepts of oppression and privilege and how they affected your lives, think critically about that, not in a way that assigns blame, but in a way that really just asks you to reflect. And then finally, how do those concepts influence your future teaching? Again, if we are come from a background where you might be um, Caucasian and female, that's kind of a very different impact in teaching versus if you are African-American and male. So think about these influences, the way our backpack can help us and also give us undue privileges maybe we didn't know about. Um, all right, so in order to get a better idea of this privilege and what it means and implications of that, we're going to watch one more coffee talk here on white privilege and get a sense of what that looks like. Well, good morning, Dr. Goodwin. Thanks for joining me. Good um, morning, Dr. Perkins. We are today going to talk about white privilege a little bit and its importance here in college education. Very good. Well, white privilege is a term uh, that's been around for a while. Uh, it refers to the inherent biases in the in in our culture, in our society that. Uh, that are afforded to, to white people, uh, generally. There are lots of different types of privilege. Um, you know, if we think about race and gender in class, there are different privileges in different contexts assigned to different, to different groups and so forth. Um, but it's undeniable that throughout our history there has been an inherent bias toward, toward white people throughout our culture. Yeah, and this is something that I think is really critical as teachers that we consider because oftentimes we don't think about the fact that we have this um, inherent privilege or students who are white might have this inherent privilege and they may not want to acknowledge that for fear that, oh, you know, we're being racist or we're not. And it's not about blame, it's just about being aware of the fact that there is this inherent privilege and it does grant you rights that, you know, other people of color might not have. For example, if you're in a store and you know you're not going to be followed in the store because of your color, or you know you had a great example of driving at night. Can you share that one? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll back up a little more. Um, you know, personally, I was a first-generation college student. My father dropped out of high school in the Great Depression, and it's easy for someone like myself to say the system is biased against me because I didn't, I didn't grow up in wealth, I didn't have role models for, for educational success. But, um, and, that's, and that's another form of privilege. Someone from, from, from economic advantage has privileges that people from, from the working class and below don't. Um, on the other hand, 
if I'm out driving at midnight and a police officer stops me, I have a certain expectation of how I'm going to be treated by that officer, but I'm very well aware that, that people with, um, with different ethnic backgrounds aren't going to have that same expectation. Perhaps there's going to be a level of fear, a level of distrust of that authority figure that, that I'm simply not going to, not going to recognize and going to understand. And I think this is something that, again, it's really just about being aware of those privileges that come with, you know, being white. It's not, a lot of times we hear, this is about blaming us for being white, about really, it's not about blame, it's really about knowing that there's these inherent privileges, knowing that you didn't ask for them, you know, you're not expecting certain things, but they come with just, you know, being who you are. And really being able to think about how that applies to your future as a teacher, your future work that you're going to do in the classroom, and what that might imply when working with students from different backgrounds, and how you need to help support them in being aware of the different things that come with their background. If you're not from, if you're from a diverse background, how that's going to impact you versus a white background. Yeah. It's very hard to understand someone else's perspective. Whenever we bring up a topic like white privilege, it's easy for us to get defensive. It's easy for us to think, well, I, I didn't do anything to cause this. This was 100 years ago. My ancestors, maybe, but I haven't done anything. Why are you blaming me? Um, but it's not about blame. It's about understanding. And it's about, it's about um, whether it's, whether it's race-based privilege, class, gender, um, religion, ability. All kinds of there are all kinds of areas um, where one group or one individual might might be uh, have the the, card, the deck loaded in their favor, the deck stacked in their favor. That's the term I was looking for there. Yeah, definitely. And I think you know, just thinking maybe about your own life and experience, like you said, you know, through your own background, you've had this experience, and you know, I as a Hispanic female have had definitely experiences where I felt that privilege kind of work against me. But then other people will say, well, hey, you've had that privilege work for you as well because you can get scholarships easier, you can do, you have access to other things easier because of your your diversity. But I think we need to be careful too in that sense that we can't, you know, overgeneralize or over um, commit to people and say that because of this, you have this. You know, it's not yeah. about categorizing or stereotyping people. I, yeah, I have an example of that. It was the spring of 1980. I was a, uh, I was a senior in college. I was graduating with a degree in secondary English education. And I went to see the gentleman who was the director of the placement office at my university, shall not be named. <laughs> and, and he uh, glanced at me and he said, oh, you won't have any trouble finding a job because you're a man in English. And that was the first time I had ever even considered something like that. I knew that most of the students in my classes were female, but the idea that, that, that administrators out there, hiring officials, would have some kind of bias in my favor because of my gender had never occurred to me. Um, and I played out. I did, I did have an inherent bias going through my career as a public school teacher because, because of the desire of building administrators to, to affect some gender balance in their, in their academic departments. And I think you know, see other people who go into areas of specialization or concentration because they feel the same thing, they'll have an inherent advantage. We have to see a lot of our students go through ESL, you know, learning English as a second language because of that. There's a high need for it, high demand, so they go in. Hopefully they change the actual and think that you know, it's really a needed field and they, they see the purpose for it. It's not just about getting a job. But yeah, there are certain fields where our STEM program, sure. definitely. If you're a female in, in one of the STEM fields, um, administrators, district school administrators, are there's a good chance that they would be looking to balance the uh, the sciences, the math departments, and so forth. Um, you know, another example might be uh, community police departments. You know, police any any police department wants the police force to mirror the population, and that means that means the demographic um, characteristics of that police force. You need you need Officers that look like the people they're going to be dealing with, and, and so it's I mean, it's it's inescapable. There's going to be a 
predisposition to try to, to recruit people to fill those, to fill those categories. But again, I think we just need to be aware and remember when it comes to that privilege, no matter what type we're talking about, like you say, which is a white privilege as well, to be cognizant of those future teachers and people in the field of education the impact that can play on our students and the lives of our students from the inception of where they are in their education, at elementary level, all the way through school, high school, and university level. Right, it's not really enough to say I'm going to treat everyone the same, or I'm going to treat everyone equally. Um, so I don't want to be biased against anyone, but we need to try to understand, um, to understand the, the histories and the culture and the, the, uh, the baggage that all of our students bring to school. Exactly. And that takes us full circle back to where we were at the beginning when we talked about getting to know our students all right well hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight and in-depth knowledge on this topic and what the implications are for you as future educators um, we're going to now jump to our second chapter in the iBook which really looks at the history of education there's a great video out there that's included, I believe, in your iBook. We're going to watch it again just to make sure that you guys get a chance to look at this. Um, and this is, video is done by Sir Ken Robinson, and it looks at the changing educational paradigm. So let's go ahead and watch this, and I'll give you a good view, overview of the history of education. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on, the earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school... We were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. And some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, <laughs> I mean, I... I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence, that real intelligence consists in this capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic. Smart people and non-smart people. 
And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising holdings, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalising them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff. <laughs> At school, for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence, totally, that the incidence of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardised testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit order increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> they can hardly think straight in Arkansas. <laughs> and by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. <laughs> and there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts... And I don't say this exclusively of the arts. I think it's also true of science and of maths. But let me, I say about the arts particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. And anaesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anaesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modelled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organised on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialised into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are. You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day, or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardised testing and standardised curricula. And it's about standardisation. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking. It was published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think 
what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One well, of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, there are tests for this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, 80 okay. 98%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of 8 to 10. What do you think? 50? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story because you could have imagined it going the other way, could you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now they've become educated. You know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth, uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. I hope you enjoyed that video and found it informative. It gives a nice overview, I think, of the educational paradigm and where we've been, where we're going, what we need to do. So let me escape out of this real quick. Let's go back to our presentation here. So what I want you to do is kind of just think about your initial response to the video. What were some key things that you took away? Did you agree with what? Sir Ken Robinson was saying, did you disagree and why? Um, but specifically, I want you to think about the implications for how you teach. What does this say about you as a future educator and how might it influence you as a future educator? And then how does this link to teaching today? Do you think we're still on that paradigm shift or do we need to move forward even more? Throughout this course, we will really look at this and look at the implications for teaching through different philosophies of education that have shaped our instructional practices. Um, we'll get into those philosophies starting next week, and we'll spend time, dedicate time looking at each of the philosophies. There'll be a chapter dedicated to six different philosophies of education. Um, the key with these philosophies of education is they impact the way students are instructed and the way they are um, taught in the school system. And that concept is explored a little bit more in depth in chapter two when we look at deculturalization. This is section two of chapter two. And I really want you as you look at this chapter and this section to think about the specific examples of deculturalization that have been experienced by the four groups discussed in this, this section of your book. 
we have Native Americans, African American, Asian Americans, and Mexican Americans. Um, I would encourage you to please make sure to watch the videos, links that are included for each of these groups, as well as explore a little bit more in depth the articles that are included, because they'll give you some great insight and information about deculturization and what it really means for the students that you'll be working with in the future. Even though this is in the past, we're going to think about implications that these students go through still today and how does deculturization impact them. So in addition to looking at these groups in your book, I'd like you to try and think if you can come up with examples of deculturization you've seen or maybe experienced and how you might address that as a future educator. So the philosophies of education, as I said, we're going to get more into later, but when we approach the philosophies of education next week, you really need to think about how you want to look at those philosophies of education. You're going to be more like Socrates, who says to do is to be, more like Aristotle, who's to be is to do, or Shakespeare, to be or not to be, or even Fred Flintstone here, that's yabba dabba do. So we'll look at that more in depth later and our schools of philosophy later. So um, just a couple of important reminders for you. The Book Circle sign up is located under the Pages tab for this week. Please make sure to sign up by um, 2 o'clock today so I can send out an email around 5 letting you know that you're okay to buy your book. If you don't sign up by 2 p.m. today, I'll just assign you a book. Um, the Are You Ready survey located under the Quizzes tab is due tonight, so please make sure to work on that. Make sure you've looked at your course syllabus and course schedules to be able to complete that survey successfully. The autobiographical narrative, what I showed you an example of, you're going to create and post by June 12th, which is tomorrow. And then you'll do peer feedback for that by the 13th. You'll also have your initial philosophy education paper due on June 13th. So those are the main things I want to go over with you this week. I hope you have a great first week. Enjoy the content. Learn a lot of this initial information. And I will be in touch. Thank you.